very good evening to all of you. We are delighted to have all of you with us for our first panel discussion this evening. This panel discussion is titled Interrogating Pasts. The past is at once a legacy to treasure and a burden to bear. It is sometimes obstinate, sedimented, and at other times it is free-flowing in the way it shapes our present and future. In different ways, notions of the past have gripped the artist's mind and informed their practice. The project showcased here point to the multiple ways in which artists have conversed with pasts. While finding inspiration, artists have also challenged, rejected, questioned, critiqued, reinterpreted, and departed from the past. Our panel discussants today are Padmini Chatur, Pushpamala, Sushnato Chaudhary, Sarbajit Sen, and Sharanya Ramprakash. We are very happy to have with us as our moderator, Jonathan Barlow. Just to briefly introduce Jonathan to you. Jonathan is a, um, a musician, a scholar. He has studied Hindustani music with several great masters. He is also an instrument maker, and for several years he's experimented with different kinds of uh, sarods, beans, and tanpuras, uh, making of these instruments. And he's also a published um, scholar and writer. Jonathan, over to you. And yeah, thank you. for inviting me to come. I don't have much to uh, contribute, but it's a very interesting panel to me, and the keynote was particularly pertinent somehow to, to this. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about the, the subject and wondering what I could say, um, this, the idea of the past as a legacy to treasure and a burden to bear. Uh, I thought first in terms, and this is probably very much a, well, I think it's a universal idea in India, the idea of Guru Shishi Parampara in music and its insistence that there is some kind of authentic immemorial element of diksha and etc. that lies at the core of practice. But um, that's just, you know, a, a a received idea. Then I thought about the spectrum in recent contesting interventions in the public space from in music, TM Krishna, to, to the politics that our keynote speaker was talking about, the politically driven forays into the domain of history and um, um, the versions the unpalatable versions that are given there. But the subject today, um, what these, this group of panelists seems to have in common is a sort of day-to-day, -day, decade, decade by decade traffic of close testing the received wisdom of teaching and composition performance as each of their artistic disciplines sort of moves from what was into what is becoming. And uh, with the drive to discover workable, inspiring embodiments of the disciplines. I suppose that this is, uh, this is a particularly conscious project in India because of colonialized, the colonial experience and um, 19th cent from the 19th century, generations of more or less modern subjects gathering, scrutinizing, scouring old practices for value, performability, authenticity, and um, at, attempting to edit their choices into what can be effectively projected and engaged with creatively in a foundational way, and what inherences need to be contested. So each of the pro projects uh, has engaged with a specific forms in, in different ways according to its repertoire and mode of ordering and its relation to self-imaging and social engagement. 
So they have a variety of pasts. And engaging with the past has become the subject and the objective of performance. So I look forward to them sharing their work with us and uh, uh, engaging in a group discussion. Uh, could um, Padmini begin with uh, her presentation? Each of our panelists will have um, 15 minutes to present. At 12 minutes, we'll have the timekeeper just make a sign, so kindly keep your presentations to time, and uh, request all the audience members to please switch off your cell phones. Thank you. Yeah, who should I signal to? Ah, not now, I need to read. <laughs> yeah. I speak a little and then... Okay. Um, I will probably need to start with a small disclaimer, which is to say that I don't see my... Um, my predominant practice as being one of interrogating the past. It isn't how I've really dis how I would describe my longer work or, or the the longer, as Jonathan said, the decades of work that I've been doing. Um, but I feel that as an artist, my starting point has been in the classical dance form of Bharatanatyam, and. Um, as I thought about today, the image that kept um, coming to my mind as a way to describe my process was that of an elastic string that's tied firmly at one end to the pole that we can call tradition. And um, just to pull an elastic string along without this anchoring is also a possible way, I think, of moving forward, moving into the realm of the contemporary. And in my case, I always think that this elastic thread somehow has itself tied to this pole of the past and the tradition as a form as well as a politic and aesthetic. And the thread can only be moved very tautly and very slowly and it's in that movement that tension lies. And I see that that word tension seems to always describe very well what I've tried to do um, with my work in dance. Um, so as some of you uh, who have some familiarity with the world of dance knows, if one has to look uh, and in a few sentences say something about the larger history of the dance form in the south of India. We can actually look at the history and the trajectory itself, perhaps as a series of ruptures, a series of both ruptures and appropriations. Um, and as, as Jonathan said, this is of course uh, very much to do also with the colonial history uh, of work, the disappearance of work in the way that we knew it, and the reimaginings, and perhaps in the 1930s uh, in Chennai, it, it was the first important moment. And we can really see the work of Rukmini Devi already as being the first modernization of Bharatanatyam. Jump forward a couple of decades. Um, in the 80s, uh, we, can, we know and we, we, we look at the work of Chandra as the first contemporizing of the form. Um, and for a moment, I think, uh, I always remember um, her comment on the idea of tradition, where she would always say, tradition isn't like an object in a museum. Every once in a while, we need to take it out down from the pedestal, dust it, shake it down a little bit, uh, and to re-look at, at this object. And that's, 
I think in the two decades uh, that she worked and, and the one decade that I worked with her, for me, actually, the project of interrogating the past was somewhere over and done with. And I felt that in the year 2000, by the time uh, we made the work Sharira together, and I had already started to begin my own uh, investigations on the side, I, I felt that it, it had been done, that Bharatanatyam as a form had been stretched to whatever limits it could be stretched, and I was, as an artist, no longer interested in this. Uh, and so I went on for another 10 or 15 years to ask sort of different questions. Um, and a, a curator friend of mine, um, Simon Dove, very briefly uh, described this transitional moment, say, that was happening in India in the early 90s. And he said, that the choreographers, whether it was Chandra, Kumudani Lakya, all of these choreographers who'd worked in the 80s and early 90s, that their uh, questions and their, their projects had been somewhere about the breaking of tradition. And he said, and the next generation will now come along to make the new traditions. And it's, it's very much what we saw, a, a real, another rupture beyond the, the rupture that Chandra made in the 80s, another rupture in the 90s, where we began to be uh, somehow open to ideas that, that came into the country from the outside. All of a sudden, the landscape of contemporary dance was no longer contained and no longer sort of asking questions about tradition and what was tradition, what wasn't, all of these long conversations with the traditional dance community started to somehow dissolve and make way for a new moment um, which seemed to be somewhere more about thinking about us within a kind of a globalized, internationalized um, world of dance. So the question, who are we within all of this globe-trotting kind of marketing um, activity that we were beginning to see for the first time became important. Um, and as a choreographer, I have to say, it was that time between the mid-90s, the early 2000s, felt liberating in a sense almost like the elastic thread had forgotten this, the anchoring moment. Uh, and my own practice went further and further into just really asking the more like simple metaphysical questions about body, about space, about present. What is it, what can performance be once we remove it from all of these, the burden of history as, as Sumana spoke about, you know, and there was this great euphoric idea that, uh, that contemporary dance was now forging ahead, finding it's, it's a new language that was somehow um, devoid of, of a baggage. Um, and at some point, sort of around 2010, I looked around my studio um, and though at one point, though my interest in working with the proposition of the Bharatanatyam vocabulary had left me, what I, was, what I remained all the time very interested in was the Bharatanatyam body. And I always, I stayed in India all the time working, and I, for me, my project was very much also about the pedagogy and about asking the question of transforming the Bharatanatyam body into something that could be more, had, that could have more capacity, that could be more neutral, that could let go of all of the mannerisms of Bharatanatyam. Um, and in 2010, I looked around, um, I have always five or six dancers working with me. I looked around my studio and I saw two Bharatanatyam dancers and four who weren't. And it was a moment um, 
when I started to think, okay, it's a shifting geology. Um, I'm not anymore, my project is not anymore working with Bharatanatyam dancers to create a contemporary idiom, but it's also to think about what's actually happened in the last two decades. Um, where, our, where are our contemporary dancers coming from today? And there seemed to be a dawning on me that this, there was a, a sort of a, it felt like a historic amnesia. And I almost felt for a cert, at that moment that there needed to be a way to, to educate, that the work of somehow remembering where we came from was urgent for me at this point. Um, and around the time, um, I had a, a meeting with a curator I was working with who was uh, curating a, a festival called Body Luggage, which was very much asking similar questions and looking at the idea of the transmutation of form in, in periods of rupture. And, and together with her, I began this project, Varnam, which was actually a film to begin with, a three-channel video. Um, and later, with the help of, of the IFA support, became a three-hour performance, which we premiered at the Kochi Biennale three years ago. Um, so before I show just five minutes of the film, um, and I want to just say something about Varnam and why, why this was my choice uh, as a way to go back to these questions of the past. Um, for me, my own work in contemporary dance was sort of constantly steering me into sort of further and further into the abstract as a means of, of, uh, of um, showing and, and doing work with the body. And at some point, I started to think again about the narrative, which is uh, such a large part of, of the Bardhanatyam um, sort of the repertory. Uh, and I thought about Varnam, for those of you who don't know um, the, the Bardhanatyam repertory at all. The Varnam is always the central and the largest sort of item within a performance. And it's a very interesting but strange mixing of the abstract and the narrative. Um, and the story of the particular Varnam I chose is a very typical story uh, of of the Bharatanatyam narrative a style, and it's talking about a heroine whose lover has left her, has betrayed her, and the heroine is waiting. Um, and in my Varnam, therefore, six dancers sit on chairs, perhaps as an allusion to the idea of waiting for the lover to return. Um, and it goes, it really jumps between these moments of very rhythmic sort of a physical, more sort of abstract uh, compositional moments and immediately goes back into these, this area of the song where, um, where the Naika is expressing uh, her love, her angst, all of this. So I took the Varnam and I worked with only one single line of the song. It, it was incredibly long otherwise. And I worked with two of these compositional moments of the Jati. Um, and in my Varnam, I wanted multiple voices. And I wanted also through the making of the work, there to be some kind of conversation between the now and the then that was somehow enfolding as part of the dramaturgy itself. I also wanted to somehow reclaim the, the narrative and the lyric um, whereas in the traditional performance, the Natvanar, who actually would speak the Jati, would mostly be a male figure. The song itself is written, of course, by a male composer. Um, and so in, in, there are several of these sort of adjustments that were made to the original format um, that were actually sort of all the time a part of process of, of making the work. Um, so I'm just going to show you, because I don't know, I'm probably going to run out of time. Let's watch the film and then we can come back with questions, perhaps. Can we do some lights, sir? Lights, sir? Ah, I've lost my sound. I can. So over 
Over the years, we performed in lovely spaces, but somehow the best film was from the ugliest space. Um, so just ignore the, the room. should be, but it's not linking up. We checked it twice. Pause or should I be watching without sound? It's playing. Yeah. Is it muted? ตักกะติกุตติกิตตะตุงตาตักกะติกุตติกิตตะตุงตาตักกะติกุตติกิตตะตุงตาตักกะติกุตติกิตตะตุงตาตักกะติกุตติกิตตะตุงตา Gopala, it is four or five months since I saw you. Last night, in my dreams, you appeared so real that Krishna startled. I got up searching for you in vain. <laughs>
with my sari drenched with tears, I worried. Did you think of me or not? Oh, the answer to the fruit of my prayers. Neither food nor beaten leaves, neither entertainment nor sleep. There was nothing for me since we parted. Um, I'm a practicing artist, but this is not an art project I got the grant for. It's actually a conference, an international conference that I organized in 2016. So it's, uh, the conference was, conference was about uh, this early modern uh, art Indian uh, Karnataka artist called uh, K. Venkatapa. So that's him. And um, so I'll just, um, I wasn't sure what exactly I was supposed to do. So what I'm going to, uh, the way I've structured is that I'll show a few of uh, Venkatapa's works. And then I'll talk a little bit about the background and why I thought of having this conference. Uh, I, uh, do, I'm, do I'm a practicing artist. I'm trained as a sculptor, and I, but I've been basically working with uh, perform, uh, per performance photography and video for the last 20 years. And, uh, but I've also been, I'm very interested in discourse and in pedagogy, though I don't actually have a job teaching anyway. So I've been um, organizing a lot of different things through the years especially after I moved to Bangalore, built my studio and moved to Bangalore. So I've uh, organized seminars and talks. Some of the talks, a series of talks are still going on in one Shanti Road called Relook, which is on um, Indian art, lectures on Indian art. So when I first um, started having some seminars in uh, my studio, it was on, called The Idea of the Folk. Uh, that was in 98, uh, eight, uh, 19, 1998, 1999. Um, several people actually t uh, asked me, why don't you have a national level conference? So for some reason at that time, I thought about having a conference on Venkatapa, but it was very much later, probably 20 years later, and that was like the uh, 20th anniversary of my um, fictional organization called Somberi Kate, uh, which means um, Idler's Platform. In fact, Dandan and Rohini have stolen my name. He was one of the speakers at one of the, he's an old friend and he was one of the speakers at uh, one of the seminars that I had of the idea of the folk. So um, 
So wh wh why this uh, Venkatapa and how did this come about? So in the first place, uh, Venkatapa is a state artist. There is a gallery named after him, the Venkatapa Art Gallery in the center of the city in Kavan Park. And uh, that has his collection as well as a, quite a large collection of uh, modern Karnataka artists. It's called the Venkatapa Art Gallery. So he, is, uh, he was a kind of uh, uh, very eccentric uh, character who uh, was the first nationally recognized uh, Karnat artist from this region. He came from Mysore and he came from an artisanal uh, family of Chitragaras, which was actually a low caste. They were palace artists, uh, he, but he was very bright. And uh, when he was studying in uh, the Arts and Crafts School in uh, Mysore, the Maharaja spotted him. And uh, they had this habit of sending these young, bright students on scholarships uh, to different places in India as well as abroad. So uh, Venkatapa was sent to Calcutta to study under Abhinindranath Tagore in the Calcutta Art School. He, uh, Abhinindranath had just become the principal over there. And uh, E.B. Havel was there earlier. And uh, there was this whole, um, um, it was part of the anti-colonial anti uh, uh, thinking and struggle. Uh, there, was, there, there was this whole um, um, uh, idea of creating a Swadeshi art. It was part of the Swadeshi movement. And some very influential uh, figures at that time were uh, Ananda Kumaraswamy, Sister Nivedita, and of course the Tagores. And um, so uh, Abhani, uh, Venkatapa was one of the very, f uh, the first batch of students of Abhadindranath and very much part of this milieu. And in fact, he got several opportunities, um, he was recognized, his talent was recognized, and also his uh, skill, artisanal skills, which also came from his artisanal background where he had helped his father on certain palace commissions and so on. But then he, uh, after seven years in Calcutta, he came back to uh, Mysore and stayed in Karnataka, in this region throughout his life. And somehow he seemed to have become a lost figure uh, in the annals of uh, Indian art history. So while the Bengal school um, was, uh, is widely written about uh, and uh, dominates the kind of cultural discourse uh, along with Ravi Varma, Venkatapa, who was quite a key figure over there in the early days, uh, is not, uh, has not really been seriously written about. And when he came here, there's this, um, he became the f sort of favorite of all these Kannada literatures. And in fact, there was this rising, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kannada nationalism, language nationalism, and uh, Kannada, uh, you know, uh, identity uh, thing at that point, and uh, he uh, also became a kind of uh, icon of that, along with Kuempu and many other literary figures and other figures. And um, he, he was like a, a very eccentric uh, figure uh, because he was an ascetic and he was um, taken on this vow of aparigraha, which meant uh, non-dependence uh, on anybody. And um, so he was the opposite of a bohemian, but also this kind of defining himself as a kind of fine artist against his whole background of uh, being from the artisanal caste. And in fact, recently I read that Michelangelo was doing that, you know, in the Renaissance. So it's very much a part of this kind of uh, history that comes down to uh, modernism. I'll quickly show you his work, some of his works, which are in the Venkatapa Art Gallery. So I did this famous uh, Ramayana series. I don't think this is there actually. Uh, but this was for a book by Sister Nivedita, a key figure at that time called Myths of the Hindus and uh, Buddhists. So all these students of Abhinindranath uh, did these uh, works. So his style was very different from the uh, pale washes of the Bengal school. Anyway, this is this famous painting much written about by various Kannada writers. His landscapes are very um, highly kind of regarded. And then he was commissioned to do these bar reliefs, the large, uh, in the Mysore Palace Darbar Hall. So anyway, so why should this figure of Venkatapa interest us at all today? Because he seems like a figure of the past. It was 100 years ago almost that all this happened. But what actually happened was in uh, 2016, the government had this new, to uh, Karnataka government had this new tourism policy and they wanted to, uh, they had a tourism vision group consisting of all our uh, local corporates and um, they wanted to give away most of our heritage uh, places uh, on uh, private, public-private uh, partnerships. And they wanted to give away um, Venkatapa Art Gallery. They signed an MOU with a private art foundation over here, which we found out in the beginning of uh, 2016. 
So we embarked on a series of protests, which went on for about two years, actually. Uh, Bangalore artists formed uh, this a group called VAG Forum, that is the Venkatap Art Gallery Forum. And there were fantastic sort of uh, art actions, uh, protests, signature campaigns. Uh, there were performances all over Bangalore. They happened in Venkatap Art Gallery as well as... Uh, and then people all over the state started also, like, uh, you know, joining us and... Uh, working, uh, doing different kinds of actions and protests. The, uh, you know, the uh, Karnataka intellectuals and the public supported us because we were fighting for the cultural commons. So this was a, a lot of energy uh, generated here. So I'll just show you a very few. It went on for two years, so there are all kinds of things, Dada-esque actions, shows, and so on. Uh, there are some meetings. There's hug wag. All kinds of wacky things, you know, very interesting. And um, yeah, that uh, that's all I could uh, can show actually. Sorry, yeah. There's this whistle and umbrella protest at town hall. <laughs> so, so then, um, so this whole uh, kind of buried sort of idea that I had of having this kind of seminar, national level seminar on Venkatapa, came up to the fore then, and I thought uh, this is the time. You know, the time is hot. So there's so much energy released over here and everyone's thinking about this. Not necessarily people are talking about the Venkatapa Art Gallery, but of course it's named on him. But then what happened, like, you know, uh, the figure of Venkatapa itself is very interesting because uh, I think Janki and I with her um, uh, essay in uh, Drawing the Line in, uh, Drawing a Line in uh, 1998, uh, brought him back into uh, kind of, uh, um, in, uh, into public, I mean, the sort of scholastic interest. Uh, she took a cultural studies uh, point of view and talked about uh, Venkatapa and his publics and how Venkatapa was negotiating. T till then, it was always written about in this kind of, uh, um, uh, what kind of hag hagiography, I think it's called, like, you know, Venkatapa was a genius and he was this mad, eccentric genius and so on. So she studied him as a figure who was, came up from a certain background and was negotiating this new space that was being created in India. And that was like he had his own negotiations with the Mysore Palace, very problematic. He filed a case against the Maharaja. And uh, then uh, with, uh, with his own past, he was constantly trying to um, differentiate himself from being uh, treated as an artisan or, a, or an employee or a, uh, or a kind of, uh, I know, um, uh, somebody could, who could be taken for granted. So he was like this artistic genius. And uh, also there was this kind of new, he was also negotiating with this, uh, the Bengal school actually, he was disagreeing with several of their things, uh, ideas, and, um, and, and then of course there's this new burgeoning sort of uh, public, uh, modern public which was coming up, which was consisting of uh, art critics, promoters, patrons, and uh, so on. There's a kind of, uh, some kind of an art market as well, which he was also cultivating and so on. So, um, so in 2016 I applied for a grant to have this, uh, it became an international seminar because Parul Dave Mukherjee, my friend, the art historian, said you have to call Partha Mitter from England uh, because he is the foremost authority on Bengal school because this had to be, had to also have several papers on the Bengal school. And uh, so then, uh, then I decided to call this other friend, Ajay Sinha, who's a very good scholar who's in America. And so all this money had to be raised. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, somehow it worked out. So, um, so yeah, I've sort of, Cut pasted something I wrote to Arundhati. Uh, she asked me, why are you applying the Grillio, you know, this uh, IFA? <laughs> so, so she asked me, uh, so I, I'll just read out uh, this thing. Uh, this is the, why have a seminar on Venkatapa? And again, uh, this very interesting thing was here we were as contemporary artists, you know, fighting with the state and asking uh, what is the role of the state and what, is the, uh, what, what, what do artists mean? Five minutes more, okay. I'll go quickly through it. So I'll, I'm just showing you some uh, photographs of the, um, it was, the conference was called Mysore Modernity, Artistic Nationalism and the Art of K. Venkatapa. It was in November 2016. So it was two and a half days. It began in the Venkatapa Art Gallery with a performance by Abhishek Hazra, who uh, there are about 50 40 or 50 diaries of Venkatapa which we've documented for the first time. And uh, let several of the speakers took material from that. So this is, uh, this is in the gallery, responding to the works. This is the audience. 
So the next two days were at the NGMA. So this was a symbolic thing where it started with the state and went on to the national space. Um, so the Sparta Mitter. So it was a kind of looking at different aspects of his work and the context around him. And I think this was the first time that, uh, you know, Karnataka has a very um, uh, new kind of art scene. It was uh, provin seen as a kind of provincial space till the 90s, late 80s and 90s, when new generations of young artists came up and everybody's people have been very active over here. And uh, now you can say it's the kind of avant-garde experimental uh, kind of art uh, city in uh, India. So there were several um, papers on uh, his time in Calcutta and the works that he did there. Uh, one important thing was the Sharanga, that is the uh, book uh, essay written by Abhinindranath, which he, he and Nandalal uh, illustrated. And that was sort of setting up a kind of a Indian um, aesthetic taking from um, earlier manuscripts, but actually addressing uh, Western criticisms and um, what was happening then. It dealt with uh, Bengali little magazines and the technological changes in designing and printing processes uh, from metal type printing to today's digital printing. A little magazine is essentially an independent publication with a small capital run by <coughs> individual or a very small group of people. But they are known for their intellectually engaging content and alternative stands in opposition to mainstream magazines published by big media houses. And it has a unique and major position in Bengali literature for more than a time of 100 years. And there is another thing. The most important feature of Little Magazine is creativity and experimentation. Uh, that is why uh, this uh, subject came into my project. But uh, it was not on the content part of it. My project was on the uh, visual and the production part of Little Magazine. Being an editor of a Little Magazine over uh, two decades, I have noticed closely the phase shifting period of Bengali printing industry. The scenario I have observed in Bengal that everything changed after the sudden and radical shifting of the local printing industry from letter press based analog setup to computer based desktop publishing or digital medium, etc. And this transition was sudden and radical. It's not a fade in, fade out. It's a sharp cut. Uh, so for the later press is concerned for more than 200 years, the basic technology remained almost same and unaltered. Definitely, there were some major leaps like uh, linotype printing or um, <coughs> some changes in fonts, in machines, etc. But those te technologies are not affordable for the small publications, independent publications like little magazines. Here I've tried to search the aesthetic impacts of this uh, technological shifting over Bengali little magazines. In first phase, I have gone through some basic research. Um, I have studied old magazines as well as the new publications, not only the good publications or uh, up-to-the-mark publications, the below average publications. I have also, uh, also gone through those kind of uh, things. I have talked to the knowledgeable persons of various branches of the field the editors, authors, book historians, designers, binders, booksellers, readers, and so on. Mm, and they are from West Bengal and Bangladesh as well. Uh, one thing I have uh, also want to mention here that uh, a little bit of uh, research I have done with the Nepali magazines of Hills of Bengal. In 
present context, uh, the publications and the history of presses of Darjeeling, that is also very much interesting, I think. Uh, at the time of doing my research, some questions came into my mind. Uh, I'd like to share a few of them with you. What I have noticed is that in today's technology, doing almost anything, like giving a drop shadow effect, or reversing a text, justifying a text, everything has become, is getting irritably easier without bothering about the aesthetic requirement or any logic. Whenever you want, you can put any effect anywhere in the page. So I think here ease becomes a crisis. Uh, at least uh, for many of the little publications, I think it's true. Obstacles create innovations. In comparison to letterpress printing, today's desktop publishing apparently looks easier. And unfortunately, the result is lesser obstacles, lesser innovations. Making things within a very short time is possible now. You can compose, design, and print an entire issue of your magazine within a couple of days. You can print a banner or a flex for your uh, stall in book fair within a few hours. Uh, so is this practice of not giving much time for any creative work occupying our mindset? Thinking over the apparently minuscule things are ignored, like everybody is uh, thinking about the cover page of the magazine. What about the back cover? It's also a part of your magazine. You should have critically address this issue, issue. Or the page number or the folio, where to put it and why. Um, still, I believe uh, if you could use it properly, these advantages of technology could be very much useful for small ventures like little magazines. But I have observed that in spite of having rich content, so many magazines are not uh, getting acknowledged due to their poor visual presence. And the problem of the average good production, they are following a same template by and large. Mm, say, uh, if uh, I would take randomly three to four contemporary issues of various magazines, one is on uh, poetry, another is on any prose uh, or short stories, another is on um, any political issues. Apart from the cover page, they're almost identical, visually. Definitely the content is different, but visually, they're mi I think they're missing the impulse of the subject. This is true uh, that the Appreciation of art is relative. You cannot suggest a predetermined model or uh, you, can, uh, you cannot make a manual for it. But what we can do to get a holistic idea of the particular art form, we could have opened up our eyes. What is going on on the other part of the world or what have already done many years ago in our own language, that could be studied in detail and that will be done easily with the help of today's technology. Uh, I think in recent days, unfor unfortunately, it lacks in our domain of little magazine. So we try to interpret our legacy as a treasure and free flowing also. A 12 day workshop was organized with the help of IFA with seven young editors from various districts of Bengal and they worked with eminent practitioners from the field. Um, basically, it was an attempt to club the old aesthetical practices uh, to, uh, with the uh, new inventions and modern technologies. The days in the workshop was divided in two phases. In the first phase, the basic aspects um, important to produce a little magazine uh, that was addressed um, with past examples, uh, like the question of different layouts in case of prose and poetry, the cover page design, 
the inclusion and placement of advertisements, selection and use of fonts, etc., and various printing processes, updated softwares and technologies, social media marketing, and so on. After a break of almost three weeks, in the second phase of the workshop, the participants created their own work. In uh, both the phases, there were some uh, brainstorming sessions with uh, some games related to bookmaking, typography, etc. Mm, I can show you some glimpses of that event. They're working. It's a session with uh, typography. It's a letter press. They are visiting a press in Kolkata. It's a four color offset machine. They are making papers for uh, the cover pages. The concept was that you can also create your own cover page. Like a issue um, is, uh, you have to publish an issue on T or hash. Then you can make, make a, uh, the cover page also you can make it from <laughs> the tea leaf. Okay. Uh, uh, there were two outcomes of the workshop, an exhibition and a book. Mm. The exhibition uh, was organized at Boichitro at the top floor of Indian Coffee House, Kolkata. Uh, it was designed with the complete and half done works selected from the workshop. Uh, I can also show you some glimpses. It's uh, images of exhibition. These are the, some, some games uh, related to cover design. The final outcome was the, the, this book, uh, Mudron Kormoshala, Little Magazine, File Copy. Uh, basically, uh, this uh, limited edition book contains text and visual materials. It was designed as a compact version of the entire workshop. Uh, let me explain. Uh, the experiences of the participants, uh, the details, analysis of the subjects by the mentors, and some reprints of old texts uh, on bookmaking that was in the book. And the workshop materials were put between the pages. I can uh, show you. I have a hard copy. Uh, so this is the book. Here is the basic texts. Those are the, is the text. And the original materials, the, so the paste in the book. These are the newspaper cuttings, reviews. Those are also printed. This is, it's a cover layout of a cover page. These are the handmade papers created in the workshop. And various methods was, uh, was um, uh, applied for the printing of these materials. Some were in four color offset, some in letter press, some um, done by screen printing, some in single color offsets, etc. So the future of the project, um, the warm responses from the domain of Little Magazine from West Bengal and Bangladesh uh, they have uh, received. And, um, some magazines are interested to organize such workshops in small towns and districts also. And personally, I have a plan to uh, reach Bangladesh with the exhibition part. That's all within three minutes. Thank you.
So, so, hello, everybody. A big hello to IFA and all my friends out there. And just a few words about um, what I'm going to do. Uh, my work is titled Ramblings, and that is what I'm somehow uh, familiar with. I, I am not a very articulate talker. So please bear with that. I always start with these words. And Spandana, you please let me know when I'm running out of time because I'll be digressing a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I start with a few lines that often haunt me and often haunted me when I started working on these ramblings, you know. Just, uh, just a trick, yeah. So, uh, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. What might have been is an abstraction, a state of perennial possibilities, footsteps of memory. And I, I firmly believe we must acknowledge this time has come. We must acknowledge the immense political strength and power of memories and nostalgia. Uh, so these few words I wanted to start with. To put it in one, uh, I mean, it's difficult to go for a single li one-liner for this work. I was, in, fa in fact, I might be, uh, once again, I might be rambling out and digressing a lot because I'll be going back and forth because I don't believe in any sequential development of things out here. I'm often back and forth sort of kind of thing. Uh, it all started, it, it is and it is not a quote-unquote political story, a social political document. Once again, I'm not a trained analyst, but then being, from, being a representative of my generation, uh, we have had to go through many important junctures. Uh, these junctures were uh, quite, quite intriguing and quite um, thought-provoking and often very disturbing. And if you call that, if you think that memory or time is uh, a bliss or a burden, I might say both. And in fact, I wanted to portray, I wanted to uh, get hold of a huge, the huge collapse of the entire middle class mindset. Once again, the entire Bengali middle class mindset to be particular, particularly after the fall of a 34 year long rule of the left front in West Bengal. And again, this is not a document on documentation on the left front regime or the power that came to be after the left front went away. Personally speaking, uh, there have been many disturbing things showing over the past uh, maybe more than two decades. Uh, it, broadly speaking, there were some uh, crevices, some seasons showing in the rule of this left front uh, because this is all about the huge collapse of the middle class, Bengali middle class mindset after the fall of this uh, left front thing. Uh, that means I'm particularly, if I want to be particular, like I was even today, this morning, I was having a, a very informal talk with John and he spent a good long time in Calcutta during the very troubled times of the 70s when we were small, but still then we could feel the ripples. I think something was there in the air there was, I mean, today something, uh, John said something which was so interesting, like he said, uh, even then there was some, there was, at times there were violences on the streets, but suddenly it came to my mind that, yeah, of course, there were violences in, on the streets, in the streets, and uh, there were murders, but such murders, or who I was talking to, uh, like Rajkumar most probably, he, he was saying something like this, 
I mean, once we talk about political murders, quote unquote, somewhere in UP or Bihar, uh, this is, and this is not necessarily a political murder because there are so many vested interests playing across the ground. But during the 70s and up till the late 70s in West Bengal and, still, and in some other parts of India, definitely, definitely in Kerala, uh, they, they were not merely murders. They preferred calling them annihilations. And that brings down a whole new chapter of history. So it all started like what? It all started like once, I mean, we grew up in a time, we grew up in a time when the left front had already started losing its, uh, losing its strength, its edge, uh, due to com many reasons, uh, complacence, uh, increasing dependence on clientelism, uh, coercion, and so on, so much so, that their uh, fantastic, their uh, fabulous land policy and all that, the pro-people sort of uh, image that was once upon a time a very big reality started taking a backseat. They were so complacent about their own, how come it's become so, okay, it's all right. Um, so um, uh, it, it uh, in fact, uh, uh, frankly telling you, even we guys in our generation, we started losing interest in the left front very much. But it doesn't mean that we wanted to shift on toward a polar opposite sort of alternative. Uh, in fact, leftism was and still now, I believe, very much in the air out there. Uh, somehow it has to be left off the center uh, kind of thing. Uh, when I, the government fell, Right on that day, I had to make a trip to my ancestral house, which, was, uh, which had been given to the hands of a promoter for this unknown story, like a G plus four sort of flat was likely to come up. Uh, and we were supposed to leave our old place and shift over to somewhere in the southern part of Kolkata. Uh, that day, the election result was out. And suddenly, there were some strange signs showing, uh, like, uh, I had to take metro, then I had to take a local train from a particular station to reach my station. I know each and every veneer of the place, the mi different mindsets of the people from this zone to that zone and so on, like which one is the strong vote bank for which part, which party and so on. But then suddenly when uh, after so many years of, you know, deja vu, all, it, it, it was some sort of a deja vu for all of us to know that yeah, every five years there's an election and election means uh, the a victory of a left front and the red buntings and the red paper flags keep hanging like as if it was because it was part of a festival, it was all ritualized. Uh, and we got so very tired, we got used to this ritualization sort of thing. Plainly speaking, you know, there may be definitely many, uh, so just a sec. So, uh, but then it, it happened, it happened like that way, that that day, that something happened which was very much unexpected, the unbelievable had happened. After 34 year long uh, rule, of the, the left from the huge, this, uh, this huge government had collapsed and so, uh, another different party like the Trinomul Congress or TNC had grabbed power. What is happening? Come to help us. Suddenly blues, it can see window. Thank you. So uh, uh, I, when I got down at uh, my local station, uh, I knew by that time the last of the results were out, was out, and it, that it, was, it, it was really unbelievable that the left front government after 34 years um, of staying in power had collapsed. But there was no jubilation on the streets. There were some uh, half muttering retreats uh, half visible, half invisible sort of faces lurking in the corners, you know, all known faces, mostly from the back streets. And, uh, and I, we all knew that they, they, were never, they never belonged to uh, any, any CPIM or CPI or CPIML. They were mostly hired by the Congress and so on, and they were mostly known as 
the uh, action guys, you know, just the, just the goons, they had worked for the TMC, but even then, they could not believe their own ears. Uh, it, it had happened. And that is, uh, that is when I suddenly I started feeling it, it in a different way, like my entire walk was becoming a deep uh, a walk uh, through a deep and dark tunnel. This, the more I was walking, the more I was get dragged into the little bits and pieces of my own past. My childhood was, uh, uh, you know, uh, jumping back at me, and I was taken to many anecdotes. And so many things were happening. Like, then I started thinking about my father and his generation. Uh, they all had their own leftist background. Uh, uh, my father was very much a leftist. Uh, uh, he, he was in, in literary activities. He, uh, he had friends uh, of the same mindset, the same pulse and all, and were used to it. But then, uh, in, during his late years, I could feel that um, he, it was more of a very big sort of romanticism that he was in. And uh, their entire generation, a very big part of the left front, or the, this, this sort of left, uh, politics in our um, uh, families or in our parts where uh, highly, uh, it was, uh, they used to hold a very highly romanticized view of what was happening, what had been happening during their prime time. And this is how it all began. I started looking, I wanted to look at things from a different point of view. I was not going to write an autobiography, but of course there were anecdotes, autobiographical anecdotes uh, crowding my pages. and uh, and. Oh, which one? Where is this? Sometimes it's left or right. I go this way. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and and this way, I mean, where I mean, now I'm going back to my some of my pages. You know, this is I'm constantly recounting memories, and uh, I'm trying to find some link between my memories and uh, the present scenario. When I started working on the ramblings, uh, seriously, uh, I, I, there was some sort of a very um, boredom and ennui working uh, on the left front's role in the West Bengal. But now, in this present scenario, suddenly things have started taking a different turn altogether. So much so that what I started with is likely to undergo some sort of changes in this final work. You know, I mean, there will be more chapters coming, and there, uh, uh, now this is, uh, even today I was talking like this to some of my friends, like, you know, now it has become kind of the bigger evil, the lesser evil sort of thing. Uh, because civilization is some sort of, I mean, the very concept of civilization is uh, uh, being turned into a placebo, and uh, the more we are all being pushed onto the borders, you know, uh, just getting into the, this very big, big black realm of oblivion, uh, the more uh, history is being reconstructed and uh, rewritten in a very dangerous way. And that is where it all began. I mean, once it's likely to begin once again, and. Um, there will be reflections of such, some such things in my pages to come. And that is all. Is that okay? So. Since, um, since you're all on, on the panel together, and you all do such different yes, sorts of work. I thought, you know, to, to start with, if you, if you could respond to each other to begin with, it might be. Maybe, maybe you have a question to send us and we can show the Well, yes, yes. okay. <laughs> closer, closer, sorry. <laughs> not used to you, not used to a mic. Okay, well, uh, you, I don't know if you have my questions with you, but uh, but um, uh, I think uh, in some ways yes. Well, in some ways, I I didn't have a very a very uh, acute understanding of your projects, 
I, I looked everybody up on the internet and uh, got to know more about it. But uh, still, you know, it's a, now I feel I'm in the zone a bit. But uh, so some of my questions for for um, um, Padmini were, you know, I I said, do you find a tricky a complicity of women in the stereotypes? I think I misunderstood your your work, you know. I didn't yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I I misunderstood it a bit. So I. Um, I, so the questions seem in a way irrelevant mm -hmm. to what you were doing and I, I wouldn't want to, you know, I don't want to pursue that. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd agree with me, possibly. Um, I'm uh, so, so I, I'm not sure, that, but for, for Pushpamala, um, I, I'm personally, I was very interested to know more about Venkatapa and his, this, this uh, idea of uh, where, where he began working with um, Nondalal Bose on, on, that, on Obadindranath's canon of Indian aesthetics. So that, that interests me personally. I mean, I'm, I, uh, something I noticed in the... the um, images that you showed of his work, I see some, I, I'm wondering if there were any Thai artists who were, because I see something in common with the, the uh, styles that evolved in Thailand, even in fact with, with um, Angkor Wat, you know, it is something more, I don't know if you, if you get what I'm getting at, but. No, that's interesting actually, because I think, uh we are also nervous about this 15 minutes that it's quite vast thing. So one of the things that uh, the Bengal school was uh, doing was uh, uh, trying to link up with this uh, Pan-Asian movement. So Okakura had started this uh, whole, this idea of the Pan-Asian movement in Japan and he came down to Calcutta and uh, they were very influenced by Japanese art and so on. So it's quite interesting that you say that uh, it reminds of, uh, Venkatapa's uh, work reminds you of Thai art, but I don't think Venkatapa was that interest, uh, <laughs> interested in the Spanish movement or even like he disapproved of this uh, Swadeshi thing of the washes and uh, the ethereal nature of the Bengal school uh, work, you know. So his, his uh, I mean, there are whole papers devoted to this. And by the way, like I think one of the things that you had mentioned in your questions was what is the relationship to Western modernism? But I think, um, People are, you know, have sort of critiqued that this whole notion of one center, like you know, modernist center. And uh, I think the uh, post, I mean, the uh, in, during the colonialist, anti-colonial movement itself had questioned that, like you know, for example, uh, the Bengal school onwards, like you know, uh, about this whole center, and they were trying to actually make several centers. And over here, it's interesting with Venkatapa because uh, he's not even from Calcutta, which is the center in, in India, but he's from Mysore state, which had another relationship both to the British and to uh, Calcutta, you know, and uh, so there are different things like, uh, for example, Parul uh, Dave Mukherjee uh, has written a whole chapter on the Shadanga and uh, Venkatapa's mm -hmm. drawings in it. I didn't, I couldn't show the drawings because uh, they're so light, you know, like we need to make uh, better photographs. Uh, we really have to, we're making the whole archive, you know, so there are no good photographs of this, even the stuff in the Venkatapa art gallery. So I had some terrible uh, slides, so I said you, no, nobody can... Uh, uh, see them like you know they're very fine drawings that he's uh, mm -hmm. uh, done and uh, basically this whole uh, uh, book is about uh, comparing uh, different parts of the um, face to uh, you know birds and animals like uh, you know the nose is like so and so and the eyes are like a lotus petal or whatever it is which is of course it's a poetic poetic, poetic mm -hmm. not literal and but also material it has a certain materiality to it so uh, yeah <laughs> okay yeah. I well, um, yeah. So yeah I, well, one thing I want to say is that uh, actually this whole uh, center and region is interesting because uh, we've got a publisher. In fact, we're working on the book. We're just now working on the introduction of the book uh, uh, with the, uh, the other editor, Deepta Achar. So Rutledge has, uh, is going to publish the book and it's going to be part of the South Asian uh, Studies um, uh, series. So it is hopefully... It'll come out Hopefully soon. it'll come out soon. <laughs> Actually, I, I will come back and ask um, Padmini. Uh, the, 
this idea I was talking to you before before the panel began the idea that um, that the archetypal movements in the, the tradition of Bharatanatyam uh, can become a kind of abstract language freed from the, from representational conventions I'd like you to I mean, I'd like to hear more about that um, yeah, I, I actually wanted to pull the discussion in another direction that yeah. could somehow encompass all of us, if, if you yes, don't well, mind. Yeah. Because I think that the question you ask is, is a very technical one, and it's, it's, I think, difficult for it to be of interest at this moment. But the thing I was thinking about through a, a lot of the conversations and that you brought up uh, the idea of, of archive and historicity. And I think that it's something, um, because a lot of us have been talking about the past, the past, and you know what's being lost, what isn't being lost. Um, and I can say very clearly, um, especially sort of in classical dance and music, we tend to get very, and perhaps this addresses your question as well, we get very sort of bogged down by the, by the idea of the canon, or this is what it is, this is what it has to remain. And therefore, especially in the history of Bhardhanatyam, since the setting up of the Kalakshetra institution in the 30s, I think the last sort of 70 to 80 years have been the most static ones. Um, and I think that the, the, the idea that how the, the question really is now, how do we give history as an interesting uh, part of pedagogy, you know, within the schools, within the, the universities, where history can actually be unraveled and worked upon, or that history itself becomes a source of material for new possibility for new creation and that we don't say that needs to be, that needs to remain, that needs to stay on the pedestal. Um, and I think that we're in a, we're in, we're in a, a, a moment where, where, where I see especially with young dance in India that people are sort of uh, quite ignorant yeah, and don't find a point of interest to the past tradition simply because I think we haven't put enough effort into a creative way to communicate, um, and we haven't deconstructed uh, our own forms, you know, and the way they've been handed down to us. And perhaps, yeah, we, we need to um, ask these questions a lot more. Do what you, is it to really interrogate the past, and why is, is it important? Do you think this, this problem of a kind of uh, confusion or a lack of interest in the past, really. I mean, the past is interesting as a received thing, but then it's completely given. In, in, in Hindustani music, for most people who are learning now, they, 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 they reproduce a received idiom without looking behind it. So they, they, people do listen to old recordings, but very casually. Yeah. And there seems to be very little imagination penetrating back into the kind of openings that might come, maybe surprising, very surprising musical openings that can come out of looking deeper back into the actual, what can be accessed through old recordings, through descriptions, through little histories, remnants of, uh, of anecdotes, through compositions, old compositions. And so so um, I'm thinking of I mean, I'm very interested in this, this uh, way in which these ancient idioms resurface. And, uh, and then he seemed to have been trapped in, he seemed to have been in a way trapped in this role. I mean, perhaps I'm imagining that, I don't know. When I thought about, I saw the, the, the site about him and um, got the thin idea that I have, it seemed that he, he, uh, his eccentricity was partly a kind of rebellion against his historical situation. I, 
that and also using it to you know to demarcate 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 himself from uh, the rest i mean it is a ploy i mean he is uh, so there's this unworldly worldly thing you know this uh, going yeah, on yeah. all the time which is very interesting so it's uh, actually uh, you know when i was uh, you know we're talking about modernism and vector pine fact we're just working on the introduction of these so these are some of the uh, you know things that we are thinking about see picasso was exactly a contemporary of uh, vector pine yeah almost exactly and uh, he there's some similarities though they of course polar sort of opposites in a sense because picasso was also the son of this uh, kind of uh, artist who used to specialize in bird paintings apparently which is a very low form and uh, from a province and he came to though he he came to paris which was the big metropolis like you know so there's a certain uh, you know similarity between venkatapa coming from this artisanal background quite humble and then going to this big metropolis where he met just everybody you know who was anybody in uh, you know shaping the kind of nation in a sense um, at that point uh, and he knew them you know and he was part of this young brood who was being trained up like you know to uh, this thing but at the same time uh, there was this whole thing of uh, artistic bohemia you know with this which was uh, sexual license and uh, the, the center of it was a brothel and so on while uh, vegtapa like took the other path you know which is a part very much centrally uh, central to indian nationalism and by the way vivekananda who was actually talking about these ideas was also an exact contemporary of vegtapa because mm -hmm. he died much earlier but uh, he was talking about those ideas of uh, chastity and ascetism and uh, masculinity in terms of uh you know austerity and chastity rather than uh, licentiousness i think we can talk yeah. about some of the other papers <laughs> yes i think yeah. so yeah. so um i i was f f fascinated by both these uh, bengali manifestations <laughs> having lived in calcutta for a long time and being so familiar with those that all those visual uh elements uh Shobhajit's drawings are fantastic and they, they they just it feels that you you are seeing that past of the, the 70s 80s uh and later so it's very uh, very intimate and bengali magazines so i don't read bangla i i all the fonts i had i do look at the fonts and the the graphic ideas and i'm sort of vaguely familiar with the long history of um, of publications there uh so i'm i i i really uh, enjoyed the ideas that you've uh, playing with there would anyone like to ask some some questions of the panelists lakshmi <laughs> but ask questions and i i'll i'll sort of group them uh, as i speak for pushpamala i had a very specific set of questions fascinating uh, i still want to know uh, how the seminar was received and whether there's been an afterlife of interest in venkatappa post your seminar because it began in the the book, the book but i'm saying in generally you know we talked about this large public protest and that sort of catapulted the group into looking at venkatappa so what kind of public life have you seen at one level the other question that i really had and i was really interested in um the diaries you talk about is there also on your part or somebody else's part an initiative to archive all you know the life and labor of venkatappa if you like uh, and is there any attempt at archiving his his work but you no but i'm no, saying another saying, huge I'm, huge I'm, thing no yeah. the, all these things came up actually uh, yeah. during the agitation itself because that venkatappa art gallery with all us we just stopped the MO, we just uh, stopped it being taken over yeah. but it's a it's an awful mess actually yeah. and uh, but it was just it's just exhausting dealing with the government because by the time we came to the end of the agitation the government fell so another government <laughs> came and now it uh, might might fall as well so it's very uh, complicated the whole thing and takes ages of your time like you know yeah, yeah sure and uh, then we had lot of we had actually fantastic things we had a world um, um, a world cafe which is a concept where we have put up tables and then people sit around tables and uh, each table has a particular topic and they discuss the topic so it was really like we've done some wonderful things lots of ideas came up for that and we had invited all kinds of different people to give ideas about this whole situation you know and um, uh, but the thing is like i, I mean 
from uh, the building itself to like there are uh, there's Venkatapas collection, there's Hebba's collection, there's this other guy Raja Ram's collection, there's so unknown collections, nobody has documented, conserved it, and it's all falling apart. So it's all there, so but So we all uh, have to, we don't even know what is there because the government doesn't keep any records of anything. Yeah, yeah. So mm, archiving, so conservation, <laughs> repair, building, uh, all kinds of things need to be done. Half of it is taken over by that archaeology department on top of that. Yeah. You know, I so that, yeah. uh, it's very, very complicated. Like, you know, so one more thing has to be started for that, and I think... Uh, uh, either someone, other gang has to do it or uh, <laughs> we have to restart this yeah. whole thing. Yeah. In fact, just recent, just now I was thinking like we, we should, because all those ideas are there, well, how we could do it and all that, you know. But, you know, it was like a uh, huge public thing, like we, we were calling meetings, public meaning within the art scene, calling meetings all the time and a uh, uh, lot of organizational work, you know, yeah. writing things, government petitions, whatnot. And all kinds of people were looking through hacking the web and finding all kinds of uh, material, like, you know, a legal material for us and uh, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. No, but it's sort of fascinating to think about, you know, maybe a larger initiative outreach to sort of publicly make these archival collections. I realize it's a impossible task, but seems to be too valuable to let go. So no, no, all the auto drivers in Bangalore yeah. know Ventapa Gallery. They didn't yeah. know it before. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that is a great achievement. No, of Ventapa course, Gallery absolutely. I, I, I take your point. <laughs> For Padmini, I had two specific questions. Fascinating. Yes. Um, you know, at one point you talked about transforming the Bharatanatyam body. I'd like a little bit more elaboration of that. And in your effort to move away from the received ca canon, your 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 artistic exploration of something else after the ruptures, various ruptures represented Arundel herself as a rupture, Chandra is a rupture, and you would be another. I'm, however, thinking about the role of music in all of this. I mean, you know, when it comes to rewriting and rescripting the history of Bharatanatyam, one can think of choreography, one can think of the world, one can think of the body. When it comes to music, for all its uh, you know, for all the improvisations that we have, whether it's dance or whether it's music, somehow the component of music that is used to me still remains what it was. Whether it's one line or one phrase or one jadi, uh, you know, you sing a Mukhari Varnam, we respond, right? So I'm just thinking in your experiment, how have you... Dealt, dealt with, with sound, the with musical music. element. So yeah. that's one question. Finally, and I really love the two papers on Bengal. It's like my favorite. The 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 uh, the one on the leftist, you know, the debacle, left and its fall. Uh, the question is, um, was using this particular form of communication, in your view, the best way of depicting the history of a contemporary moment? Of Not a book. Not just, and this sort of combination of text and visual, sure. did it really, does it actually, I mean, to me, it gives a lot as a reader, yeah. but I'm also wanting to find out this yeah, as sure. an artist, as a practitioner. Yeah, how, how did it actually help a little bit on the process yeah. that, you know, that contributed to this mm. wonderful work? I mean, the, the stuff on fonts, absolutely fabulous. And so another quick comment, uh, the, how has this again been received I'm not thinking of Calcutta and, uh, you know, little magazines, which has got a slightly richer history, but mm. I'm thinking more in terms of, you know, Uttarpara, provincial yeah, yeah. spaces, yeah. which has yes. a slightly different tradition of little magazines. So mm. how did this initiative actually resonate with more local efforts, with printing, with font, and with the pride in sort of Bangla? Okay. Um, so when I, when in my reference and when I talk about the Bharatanatyam body, uh, so I talk about it in two ways. One is a highly specifically trained body, which is taught to, to, uh, to create certain lines in space, which, is lear which learns to occupy certain geometries. Um, which it can do, it can, the Bharatanatyam body can wake up in the morning and fall into a perfect Aramandi and a Natya Rambe and everything's fine. Now, for me, the interest was really, when I started to work, um, for many years, I was working with Chandra, I was working 
by myself alongside. Um, I started to realize that this, that particular stylization becomes a kind of a, a prison in its own way. That it was, it becomes very difficult, for instance, to give a simple example, the, the Bharatanatyam dancer has a tendency to always hyper-curve the spine. So the whole orientation of tailbone, thorax and head lies in a certain way, which is necessary to open the hip for the Aramani. So those are technical things. Um, and so the simple question, how do I reverse that? How do I uh, get rid of this? Supposing I want to do the counter curve or supposing I want to just be able to raise my arm without this tension of the pataka hasta. Which, and in the, my observation and working with so many Bharatanatyam dancers, everybody who came to the studio had such a difficulty, but also a fear to let go of this knowledge, which had of course taken years to train. So a big part of my process was to unlearn, to really, come back and ask, what is the body without all of this knowledge and stylization? And how do we actually come back to just really thinking about anatomy as a more kind of health? Because also, I was concerned a lot about injury in my time working with Chandra. Um, but I mean, those are, those are things that led me into certain areas of research. Um, but it's not for now. And to answer also simply the question ar around music. Um, so I also have made several works in which I haven't ever touched Carnatic music, simply because of the problematic and difficulty. And I've worked predominantly with my partner and composer, uh, Martin Visser, on all my music, he's, he's Dutch. Um, and so when I came to Varnam, he, he said to me, but what do you want me to do? Because the Varnam already has its music. And so, so we had to think and look very carefully because of course it's a very daunting task to unravel this. Um, but our unraveling was in the layering of other sound, I think. I mean, it's difficult to get a sense from the short clip. So, but there's this constant, very industrial, mechanical, disturbing kind of almost noise that sort of tries to cut through the lyricism and the prettiness of, of the sung line. At the same time, we really stopped the way the Varnam is set up, it's actually fragmented halfway through a single line. And we actually stayed with that one fragment through the whole three hours. That's all you hear. But it's, it's sung much more insistently in a way than that one would hear it. And, and for the Jati as well, I really worked to reorganize, to, to bring it even below the first speed to start with. And then always playing with this idea of almost stopping it. So going between the sound and the movement in a way that the sound and movement start to create a different kind of uh, connection between them. So I mean, th this was the, the starting of, of the approach. Should I? Yeah, so uh, getting back to what you asked, you know, uh, I come to you in a roundabout way. Um, like, I do believe in and I respect story, quote unquote, but story not in a very meta sort of sense, you know. Stories galore, uh, out of no stories. And no story is a story for me. Uh, so I believe each and everybody uh, does have her or his own story deep inside. It's all about communication. When they want to communicate, the moment they want to communicate, they communicate a story, they inherit the land of that story. And for me, if comics is a sort of a philosophy for me, comics or graphic novel in that sense, uh, further ensures that inheritance. It becomes a tool in my hand that is justifying my mode, you know, my medium. But then why this sort of thing? Uh, I was asked by a very relevant question, asked by IFA, uh, a fabulous question, 
like uh, would there be a very symmetric, uh, I mean, very consistent use of one particular style, or would it be, uh, how do you define your style? So I said, yes, of course, it was fantastic, because there are chapters which are so very disturbing that they don't, uh, they don't uh, um, want to be, they don't need to be, uh, they don't deserve this sort of like beautification or prettification you were saying, not that. So just to break that, just to cut it down, uh, I needed jerks, I needed, I needed uh, disturbance, noises in lines, like um, that is why we always love, the, once again digressing a bit, that is why we always love those protest uh, films, animation films, from Czechoslovakia or uh, Russia and all that because of this noise, you know. So this sort of thing, everything played like this and uh, uh, that is why I decided to stick to, uh, to, to bring in some noise in my style uh, and it all depended on the chapters, the chapters that I was dwelling on. Like out here there was yet another chapter where you won't be getting any disturbance like that because it was really get, taking me down like a small piece of poetry to a very remote childhood. Nothing happens, just rains, rains, and rains, and a familiar man comes with a uh, hook in his hand, a fishing hook, and you know, like a spear, and gets a fish, and just some moments are created. Out there, it's absolutely a different style altogether. So that is how I mm, look at it, you know. Um, in, uh if the local uh, new magazines, little magazines are concerned, uh, definitely uh, there were the rich history of local magazines. But uh, if you have to create good productions, you have to think about it, then definitely uh, Bengali little magazine holistically and apart from that, whenever uh, a good bookmaking, you are getting an instance of that, maybe it in Bangladesh or in New York or in China, you have to go through it. And number one, and number two, if production and printing is concerned, uh, if uh, physical printing, we're talking about later presses, there were, locality was a factor. In a small town, there was a good press. They have uh, those uh, kind of typefaces, a 10 by uh, 8 point uh, Borges typeface, or a 10 point, uh, 10 point typeface, the small bica, those kind of thing. But if you are working in Photoshop or in InDesign, Whatever you are working in any place, when, wherever you are working, that doesn't matter. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, well, engaging with the past, there is a strong tendency to romanticize the past. And, uh, for example, when Sarabjit was speaking, he's uh, talking about annihilation uh, as if it was a good thing or a better thing. And uh, in the case of sm uh, small magazines, so while we uh, romanticize the look of it, so what, is, what goes into the content and how, how is that transferred to the newer younger artists? In the case of Venkatappa, so what exactly, apart from the keeping the institution of Venkatappa alive, what is the need for reviving Venkatappa's Sorry, I, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, please. No, I mean, I mean, I, I couldn't uh, get each and every word. Like, uh, I, I could get the first part of your thing, you know, like about romanticizing and all. Uh, and then you talked about this annihilation sort of thing. Yeah, like, when you talked about annihilation. Yeah. It uh, figured like it was like um, a better thing. Uh, it happened. No, like. what I meant was, what I meant was, no, it's not that. What I meant was, you know, I, I mean, that calls for a very long uh, sort of discourse and all. Uh, this is uh, very much a, this is how I look at things, looked at things, and still now look at things from my own point of view, because here the personal is the political. And I am not at all a political or social analyst out here to go for a very broad and general sort of history. Uh, what I try to say, try, I am trying to say in this book is, mm, uh, all these years, seeing things from my point of view, communicating with my uh, father or my uncle or the people from their generation who all were uh, be belonging to a certain sort of political ideology, uh, the, how helpless they felt be after the fall of this uh, government. Uh, so that is how, when I started talking to them, trying to, when I started trying to peep deep inside their mind, 
I could feel jolly well that uh, there was some sort of a vacuum. It was a very big vacuum, and they were not even, they were also groping for the real answer because only then what came out was they, I mean, they admitted, and we all knew it, the romanticism was very much in the air. And romanticism still now tends to be very much in the air, otherwise we won't have survived. So that is why, I mean, this, this romanticism was very much, I am also a romantic, uh, I believe in romanticism. And often I shared my own words with my father. And uh, that, that, yeah, that, was, that became some sort of a common ground for us to stick on to. And then, uh, at the same time, some sort of despair worked because of this fall. And if you want to ask, like, why this fall, uh, then it, once again you are inviting a lot of things, like you have to go for analyzing history, political history, and all that. One, two, this annihilation sort of thing, what I tried to say is today, the entire uh, scenario has so uh, inhumanly changed and is changing that now, in retrospect, uh, what looks like uh, what was uh, uh, just another stabbing or just another shooting at the end of the road or the, the bend of the lane, you know, was very much scary those days, of course. But when these days, when, uh, you know, organized crime and violence are taking the center stage and getting the rubber stamp approved, uh, you know, it's, it's all being, uh, you know, what is this called? Like this uh, absolutely manufactured sort of, I mean, it's, it's constantly being uh, run and managed by you know who. Uh, then, it's in this world of mindless violence, uh, those things which don't have, which have other things uh, in question like caste, creed, religion, and so on and so forth. In comparison, when we think about those days, Perhaps they used to call that a political murder, but it was, they preferred calling that annihilation. No killing is a good thing, and, and no killing is very pleasant or smooth, smooth sort of thing, you know. I didn't mean that. I meant what, I mean, uh, now in re retrospect, the, that, that, what to say, that ambience, uh, that, that uh, total ambience seems to be much more familiar and as if it was less threatening than what it is today. That is what I tried to say. You ask about sm small magazines, little magazines. Basically, it's not romanticizing the past, it's romanticizing the present also. Uh, you'll be astonished to hear that uh, all, more than a thousand little magazines are published even in today in Bengal. First, I want to say that the VAG Forum agitation and the Venkatapa conference were not directly connected at all. It's just that that whole, I, I had been personally thinking about organize, uh, organizing a conference on Bengtapa for a long time and it came up actually uh, because there has to be a reason like, you know, to do something. And uh, then anyway, also one has to think why is he of interest today? And then with the energies actually unleashed by this uh, whole agitation, uh, it was the, I felt it was the kind of the time was ripe to actually look at it in another way because actually we were thinking about uh, cultural commons, our heritage, the archive, conservation, the museum, the gallery, uh, the, uh, the status pa patron, uh, uh, the role of the artist, so many different things, you know, like we were discussing during that time. And I think, uh, so the conference actually became a kind of, but the, uh, what I've always been um, interested in is, uh, I'm very, in my own work as well, I constantly work with the archive and I'm very, I mean, in fact, people have called my work an inventory or an archive of images. Uh, so I'm very interested in this notion of the archive and I feel like uh, one of the things I feel like having studied um, art for many years and art history is that art history and art criticism uh, is uh, com completely North Indian, like, you know, it belongs to the cow belt. There's hardly any proper uh, work have been done in other areas, definitely not in the south. So in, in Karnataka, for instance, everybody is obsessed with the uh, Velur, Halebid, etc. Like, you know, Chalukya, Rashtrakuta, blah, blah, the medieval period as it's called. And nobody is working on the, even the 19th century, 20th century, 21st century, forget it. Maybe now there are some, at least some better kind of uh, art criticism. So it's also a kind of uh, introducing a certain rigorousness into thinking and as I mentioned, like for the last 20 years, I've been organizing things like talks, seminars, and uh, I write also and publish and uh, curate uh, shows and so on. And uh, it's actually to, um, and with each thing, I try to introduce a kind of rigor, like, you know, into thinking. 
And I think history is very important because it, uh, uh, it, it makes you know what, what is your context. Uh, you know, so it's not, uh, it's nothing to do with uh, nostalgia actually. In fact, the material around uh, Venkatapa is very kind of sentimental and, uh, you know, whether it's uh, Shivram Karanth writing about it or uh, Ku M. Poo writing a poem on him and all that, it's very, very sentimental actually. And there's no proper analysis of what his work, I mean, I'm not, we're not even saying, I'm not interested in him being a great artist or anything like that. Just saying what, what is he about and uh, where does he stand and what is our relationship to him and <coughs> the whole conference papers are around that. Um, um, so actually, uh, just to maybe pick up from what you were just saying, uh, Pushpamala, about uh, why you think history is important, because history gives a sense of context. And I feel uh, that actually um, the kind of question that I have for the way um, this entire panel has been framed and largely, uh, because actually Sumana started by saying, is the past a burden or is it a treasure, right? And and when you when you say that actually history for you is important because it, it actually indicates a certain context, I thought that, um, you know, one of the adventures of, of artistic practice is to actually also produce context. So in that sense, produce, it's sorry? context. Oh, context. Um, so there is, there is also an active collision, um, you know, uh, with a certain kinds of historical thought and, and various forms of historiography. Um, but the question that I actually have is uh, at some level a very simple one, but it kind of takes from various things that were said throughout the panel. Um, so, uh, you know, um, Sarabjit, you kind of uh, had this very evocative description of walking to your, uh, to your ancestral house on the day of the elections that were announced, uh, the results of the elections were announced. And it actually reminded me of this wonderful article called Walking the City by Michael DeSoto, where actually um, DeSoto is walking through New York and has a, has a recollection of having seen the city from the top of the World Trade Center. Uh, but at the time when we were reading that article in, in, in class, in university, um, uh, you know, the World Trade Centers had actually been destroyed. So there was then no physical referent. There was then, the memory had doubled up on itself, like both literally as well as in the context of the production of that piece, right? Um, so in that sense, what the, and, and then Padmini, you kind of are speaking about how for you, your practice is like the tying of a thread that has certain elasticity and one pole is tradition. And that metaphor somehow is only useful till such time as the elastic thread retains elasticity, right? Um, and after that, uh, the, the thread is lax, then that metaphor perhaps has little use to then describe what, what that entire kind of process might be. Um, so I, I, I suppose the question that I have is that are we looking in, in framing the entire day like this, are we looking at the past as a resource? And if we are, then, then we kind of run the risk of then saying that, that resources can, A, uh, have, are termed as resources because they can be, they're useful, and, and also, inversely, they can be exhausted. So, so I feel that it's actually a very utilitarian um, framing of, of the question of the past. And I feel that whilst all of these, kind of all of the sort of entry points that you kind of uh, presented in, in each of your presentations are far more, far more uh, interesting and dynamic and actually uh, evocative than that. So I feel that in, in the framing of, of the past as almost this resource, um, I, I somehow feel that we're actually losing out on the, on the adventure of, of artistic thought and practice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started right at the outset by saying that this topic of interrogating of the past isn't really, hasn't been my predominant work or practice. It was in my 25 years of, of making. This is the first time I actually re-looked at anything from the Bharatanatyam repertoire. Uh, but to say quickly a, a couple of other things. I think, um, I, I think that dance has a very um, different problem from, from people who come from visual practice or language-based practice in that it deals with the body somewhere. 
and the body needs to be trained. And we live um, in this current context at a time where we're asking serious questions about what is that, what could that training be? If we don't, if we reject completely the training, a very rigorous training that was passed down uh, th through several generations, an oral tradition predominantly of how to train the body, all of the ideas that came were given to us through the, through the old texts that also taught us how to think about the body. What do we replace this with? I think is a very big question that several institutions that are looking to create uh, new dancers for new kinds of thinking. And what we've ended up doing is having, uh, replacing it with this idea that, but I can, like the other day I met a girl who's studying in Delhi somewhere, she said, oh, when I came to this MA program, I realized that I can do anything on the stage and it's contemporary dance. So it's, for me, it's, this space is a very interesting, but also a very crucial space to look at. Yes, the past can be, and perhaps must be a resource, but of course, as you say, it's very important for us, the people who will educate future generations of dancers in India, or work as choreographers with future generations, to really think critically and politically about what, how do we use this great resource? And for us to also decide at what point does that resource become unnecessary? But I mean, I have to say I'm personally at a point where I feel we're nowhere ready. You know, we're nowhere ready to just dismiss and let go of this, uh, of those knowledges. But out of those knowledges, I think there's a need to develop contemporary thinking and pedagogic ways to use those very resources. And I think that's, there's not enough of that being done, I think. But I think there's a, a need and an, a very important, it's a very important time for us to think about this. Um, really close the session here. Um, just a very quick point. I don't know if in IFS framing we really thought about it as a resource, but it was open here for discussion. But we'll, of course, continue this conversation. Um, we are all around. Um, thank you very much, John, Jonathan Barlow, uh, for a fantastic moderation of this session because this has really been a, um, a, a very diverse kind of engagement from all the artists here with the idea of the past. And uh, some of them conflicting, some of them, you know. So it's been really lovely having all of you speak. Thank you, uh, Shadbhujit, Pushpamala, Padmini, and Sushnato for uh, this session.